All right, just to give a recap of last time we were together, um, we're continuing through our discussion on the human constitution. So, talking, so we started by talking about the soul last time, and um, we were defining the soul from a biblical perspective. And so we rather briefly discussed its historical development through church history, um, and then talked about how the Greeks were the first in the West to really formulate a comprehensive definition of it. And then the language and philosophical tools that were developed by them were also used by the church to assist in forming the definition within the biblical framework. We covered the Hebrew word for soul, which is nefesh, and dug into numerous biblical references concerning it. And namely, we learned that the soul is associated with the body. That is, it is within the body, but it is distinct from the body. We learn that the soul is associated with personhood, that the soul is associated with emotions, which is made quite clear from its numerous uses in the Psalms especially. Then, of course, we looked at its use in the New Testament, learning that the soul can be redeemed and that it is also eternal. And so from there, we put together the definition that the soul is a spiritual part of man that bestows to him personhood and a spiritual nature. So the soul persists after life and then will be located in heaven or hell. And then subsequently we talked about the three views regarding man's spiritual constitution, and these will kind of be the overarching views when it comes to our discussion of human constitution in general, um, or rather spiritual constitution, but those are monism, dichotomism, and trichotomism. With uh, monism is the view that man is only one element. Dichotomism is the view that man is divided into two elements, so the body and the soul. And then trichotomism is the view that man is divided into three elements, the body, the soul, and the spirit. And I gave my personal opinion, which is that dichotomism is the, the biblical view, since I think that the soul and spirit are used interchangeably in scripture. But today we'll, we'll continue going through the constitution of man, and now that we've covered probably the, the more significant component of human constitution, which is the soul, now we'll cover the components that remain, which are body, spirit, heart, mind, and conscience. And so to cover the remaining components, I'll, I'll kind of follow the same pattern we were doing with soul. So I'll list out the part of man and then talk about the word for it in Hebrew and Greek list out the definition, and then we'll look for or look at biblical references for those components. And so we'll start off by talking about the body. So the body, we, we've already talked about a little bit so far, but the body is the physical component of man. When we're talking about the human framework, when we're talking about the human constitution, the body is the uh, only physical component that man possesses. And, of course, we're talking about everything physical. We're talking about the organs. We're talking about the skin. We're talking about just everything about the body. And in the Hebrew, there are two words in the Old Testament that are translated as body. And uh, the first word is jevia, which refers to a living body. And that's jevia. And so we'll, we'll go through a couple scriptures, and I'll go through them fairly quickly, but um, we see uh, several examples. Um, one example is found in Genesis chapter 47, verse 18. And this falls in the context of the Egyptians in the midst of their famine coming to Joseph for food. And so starting in verse 17, where uh, Moses says, So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for horses, the flocks, the herds, the donkeys, and he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And then in verse 18, And when that year <clears throat> was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. That was chapter 47. The word bodies there is translated out of the Hebrew javia. So again, talking about a living body. Another example is found in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 37. Um, kind of a, a similar use of it. But when the Levites were confessing the sins of Israel and identifying the consequences for their sins, uh, in verse 36 in chapter 9, um, they say, Behold, we are slaves this day 
in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And then verse 37, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. So the word bodies, again, here comes out of Javia. Now the second word that is translated as bodies, and this is probably the more common one that we see, is basar. And the transliteration is B-A-S-A-R, so basar. And it's the, the more common one, but it's also more common that you will see this to be translated as flesh in the Old Testament. As flesh, And we see this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, where God is talking about removing one of Adam's ribs, and he covers that place back up with flesh. The word basar is used there in verse 21. We see it also used in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, when after the flood, when God is making the covenant with Noah, and he says, I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So in Genesis 2.21, we see that flesh is used to refer to literal flesh on the body. So talking about actual flesh. But then here in uh, Genesis 9, we also see that it is used to refer to bodies in general. So in other words, flesh is generally used as a literary device in the Old Testament specifically a synecdoche, which is a device that uses a part of something to refer to the whole. So the Old Testament will generally use flesh to refer to the entire body, as we see in Genesis chapter 9. Now in the New Testament, definition and use of the word body doesn't differ tremendously, as you would probably suspect. In the New Testament, the word translated as body is soma, and the transliteration is S-O-M-A, Soma. And we see this word used in the New Testament about 150 times. So it does refer to the physical body, but it can also refer to a sinful nature. So in 1 Corinthians 5.3, Paul speaking to the Corinthians of sexual immorality, says, for though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3. And so you notice the contrast here between body and spirit and in the same verse. So the word body is translated out of soma, and the word spirit here is translated out of pneuma. And so you have this nice little contrast which tells you that, you're, that they're really two distinct separate things, body and spirit. But we also see Soma in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, when, uh, speaking of the body of Christ, when the writer says, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the New Testament uses it to define a physical human body. And one reason I, I'm using a couple of references in the New Testament here is because I want to now take a slight turn we talked about flesh in the Old Testament. We talked about how there's a little, how they're generally used the same way in the Old Testament, body and flesh. But in the New Testament, we see a slight variation from how flesh is used in the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, you can't really mix them. Um, while you can use flesh and body almost interchangeably in the Old Testament um, and be relatively okay, the New Testament adds an interesting use of the word flesh that we don't see near as often, if at all, in the Old Testament. And so it establishes a distinction between flesh and body, um, at least in terms of categories. Um, we do see it normally, but the word for flesh that the New Testament uses is sarx, S-A-R-X. So it's not the same as the word used for body. And we do see sarx used to describe the flesh of animals and to describe the physical flesh of people. So it is used in an entirely physical sense at times, just like the word flesh in the Old Testament. But unlike the Old Testament, we do see some spiritual aspects of flesh indicated in the New Testament as well. So one notable example is John 6, 52. We see sarx used when Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
So we see a, a spiritual component added to flesh. But sarx is also used to describe the sexual union of husband and wife. In Matthew 19, 6, when Jesus says, so they are no longer two but one flesh. And the word sarx is what is translated into flesh here. And so husband and wife are one, though mysteriously they are one in a spiritual sense. So there is a spiritual aspect associated with flesh in the New Testament, and in a positive way, um, as in the New Testament says that this is a positive way, um, or a spiritual aspect of flesh in a positive direction. But in the same vein, we see sarks used in the spiritual sense, but also in a negative way. We see sarks used to indicate sinful motives and sinful desires or even a sinful nature. So you have a physical body, according to the New Testament. So there is still the use of soma. You have that physical aspect to you. You have phys a physical body. You have physical flesh. But there are some spiritual functions that are somehow associated with the body and the flesh. And there is some type of interaction taking place between the physical and the spiritual. And how then is this sense of flesh related to the body? and then to the whole of man in general. Fortunately, there is no shortage of passages to look at to attempt to answer this question, but probably one of the best texts to look at this contrast is Romans chapter 8, verse, verses 11 through 13, which if you'll turn there, Romans chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, because this passage uses both Soma and Sarks. And it uses them a couple of times here. So starting in <clears throat> verse 11, Paul says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, <clears throat> he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, I'm reading from the ESV, and if you're using this version, then each time you see the word body, it is translated from soma, and each time you see the word flesh, it is translated from sarks. Now, if we start in verse 11, <clears throat> we can look at the use of the word bodies and know that what is being referenced here is a physical body. This is indicated by the adjective mortal. Because what is spiritual is not mortal, what is spiritual is immortal. So therefore, Paul is at first here referencing a physical body. And interestingly, though, it's not something physical we're told the mortal body obtains, but actually it's said to obtain something spiritual. And by the Holy Spirit, the physical body obtains spiritual life. And then in verse 12, we're told that we are not debtors to the flesh, so we ought not be living according to the flesh. And then in verse 13, Paul tells us that to live according to the flesh, we will die. And this has a slight echo from Genesis 2.17, when God tells Adam, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. We know that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, they didn't physically die, but of course, physical death was introduced into the physical domain, sure. But we know really what occurred immediately was spiritual death. They were cut off. That's also why God separates them from the garden. So there is a spiritual disconnect between man and God, but then also a physical disconnect because God's next step is to remove them from the garden. He is no longer going to dwell with them. And this is kind of the same aspect or the same perspective that Paul is referencing here. So in Romans 8, this is also what is in mind. That if we live according to the flesh, we will die spiritually. But if we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live spiritually. Thus our sinful nature is manifested by our deeds and actions. But more than that, based on verse 12, it seems that sinful temptations and desires also are mixed with the physical body somehow since we're told not to live according to the flesh. 
indicating that the flesh is providing some kind of temptation that we ought not live by. And it's also interesting that Paul specifically says, or he doesn't say, don't live according to the devil. Don't live according to sin. As these are, as if they are, well, they are two separate entities, but he's not saying that here. He's saying don't live according to the flesh. Don't live according to the world or don't live according to the devil. The specific word that he uses here is don't live according to the flesh, sarks. So while we do have a sin nature, and while the devil does exist, and while the world does exist, and while our sin nature is redeemed through regeneration, and the old has gone and the new has come, there does seem to continue to be sinful temptation that the believer struggles with. And the source of that temptation is what the New Testament calls the flesh. And this is exactly why, as well, that we receive glorified bodies and why the glorified body is such a significant thing. Of course, the glorified bodies have immortality, but that's not the, the main reason. Because in Philippians 3, 20, 21, which is a phenomenal contrast to Romans 8, this passage we're reading here, but in Philippians 3, 20, 21, we're told, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. So by the power that enables Christ to subject all things to himself, by that same power will he transform our lowly physical bodies into these glorified bodies. And so I would argue that if our flesh, if our physical bodies were not marred and were not stained by sin, then really there wouldn't be a need for a glorified body. The fact that we will get glorified bodies points to the reality that sinfulness is housed in our physical bodies somehow and somewhere, even for those who are regenerate. Because it's not just the unregenerate. The unregenerate will not get these glorified bodies in the sense that we do. The regenerate get them. But if the regenerate have no sin nature, if the regenerate have truly been redeemed, then what's the point in getting a glorified body? Well, the answer is because the physical body still is marred and stained with the effects of sin. Yes, sir. Are you going to touch on Romans 7 while Paul is saying all these things? No. no. Oh. How about Romans 13? Yeah, there's... There's a lot. There's a lot to talk about for sure. Um, but just a few verses down from Romans 8, from this passage we're reading in Romans 8. So in Romans chapter 8, 22 through 23, just a few verses down from the passage we're reading, Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. It connects it to, there's a connection between the groaning of the yes. and the groaning of ourselves as these mortal bodies that mm -hmm. still affect us and have us. Yep. Groaning, this, this yearning, this inward crying, this waiting for this glorification of our bodies, this redemption of our bodies. And so 22 and 23 are really this great epitome or climax of verses 11 through 13, because it's the great contrast. 11 through 13, Paul is saying not to live according to the flesh, but in 22 and 23, he's saying there is an end in sight, that you will be struggling with this. You will be, as a Christian, you will still be struggling with this temptation. You will still be warring within you against these temptations, but there is an end in sight. This battle will not be eternal. There is an end in sight. And so in verse 23, at the end, he says that you're eagerly awaiting for this redemption of our bodies. And that's significant, the redemption of our bodies. He specifically states that our bodies can be redeemed. He doesn't say the redemption of your souls, the redemption of spirit, the redemption of mind, the redemption of heart, the redemption of conscience, and so on. Instead, he says the redemption of our bodies. And again, the word soma is used here. So a physical body is what is in view. 
we're adopted now. But it's the... Yeah, it's the Unfortunately, there's no commas in the Greek text. <laughs> um, but no, that it is the consummation. So it's right now we are adopted, but we don't have all of the benefits of that adoption. We don't currently dwell with our adopted father. And so we have that adoption. We have the right to pray. We have the right to God's throne room, but we're not currently residing with him. And so we're still waiting for that consummation where we can reside with him, which will also involve the, redeem, the redemption of those physical bodies that we possess. But if we, if we put this together, we can see that the flesh refers to the portion of man in which sinful desires still exist. The portion of ourselves that we still yearn to be sanctified. So it's the portion of man that we yearn to be glorified and that will be fully glorified and sanctified after death. And, or the second coming of Christ. And so that said, to summarize, in the New Testament, body can refer to physical body, person or man, and it, and it even is used to refer to the church body. But flesh can take on a more spiritual aspect, and flesh in, the sen- in that sense is primarily used to refer to the part of regenerate man in which sinful desires remain. And I would add here that if we are truly regenerate, then we absolutely hate this part of ourselves. That the flesh is what can make us cry and weep and gnash our teeth in rage and sorrow because how tired does the true Christian become in his battle against the flesh? And it it is something that we loathe. It is something that we despise. And it is something that we pray daily or should be praying daily to have victory over And that's the whole point of practical sanctification. And and that's why we pray. That's why we read the scriptures. That's why we attend church. That's why we need the gospel proclaimed to us over and over again. And that's also why we need the brethren. We need the saints. And that's why we need to be reminded of the gospel. So it's not like after we become saved, after we become regenerate, we have no need for the gospel. We have no need for the singing of songs. We have no need for the church. We have no need for these things. But in reality, it says if we need them even more, because now we are saved, now we are regenerate, but this fleshly battle we have still remains. Now, granted, it's not as much as it's not as powerful as it was before regeneration, but there is a, a battle that still exists. And now you know the difference. Yes. Yeah, your conscience has been redeemed as well, and so you actually know that there is a battle to fight after regeneration. Um, however, if you ask how we can have sinful desires since our sin nature has been redeemed and regenerated, and if you ask me how can the physical body contain sinful desires, then I will tell you that I don't know. And actually, I would hear your question, and I would raise you the question of how were it possible for Adam and Eve to sin if they didn't have a sin nature. And so that question gets at the same heart the first one does, that there doesn't seem to be a 100% categorical isolation between the nature and the body, that there is still some type of overlap that occurs. Um, But be that as it may, this is another mystery that our Heavenly Father hasn't seen fit not to reveal to us on this side of glory. Uh, But he has at least revealed that it is a reality nonetheless. And as Christians, we are not afraid of mysteries, for we have faith in our Heavenly Father, and we trust in His wisdom and power in bestowing to us what He sees fit for us to know. 
Yeah, you, you could. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, and note also that we will get to homardiology, or if we will, God willing, that when we get into homardiology, which is the study of sin, that will list it, um, we'll get a lot more in depth into the sin versus the body and versus the flesh and the world and the devil uh, and so on. And then there's a, of course, multiple theological theories, and it gets fairly esoteric from there. But um, we'll, we'll revisit that concept in homardiology. And, but I bring this up today to show that there is a distinction between body and flesh and in how the scripture uses the two. But that does it for body, so we'll move on to discussing spirit. Now, as I pointed out last time, I personally do not believe spirit is distinct from the soul, and I believe that scriptures use spirit and soul interchangeably. Um, however, you may disagree, and, that, and that's totally fine, and that's also why I still want to cover it today, so we can continue to be objective and continue to look at these. Um, so since spirit is referenced in relation to the human constitution, we'll still go over the term, but we'll start with the Old Testament's use of it. And in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word translated is ruach, which is R-U-A-C-H in the English, and it is translated, or it is used 377 times, which is about half the time, or about half the uses that nefesh is used, because nefesh for soul is used roughly 750 and so spirit is 377. The primary use of ruach are breath and wind, but it is also translated as spirit. So for one reference of it being used as wind, you have the, the classic passage of Ezekiel 1.4, where he's saying, As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it. And so the word wind there is translated out of ruach. One example for it being used for breath comes from Ecclesiastes 3.19. In verse 19, the writer says, For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts in, is the same. As one die, so does the other. They all have the same breath. And man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. And then also Psalm 18.15 then the channels of the sea were seen, and the fountain and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. So ruach is used for wind and breath. Now, when it comes to ruach being translated as spirit, there are two ways it is used. One way is that it is refer it references a spirit in the sense that we might associate with a demon or an angel. So it's used as a standalone entity that's not affiliated with a human being, so such as an unclean spirit. A good example of this is found in 1 Samuel 16, verses 4 th 14 through 15, when the evil spirit that is tor with the evil spirit that's tormenting Saul. And in this passage it says, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. And so that word for spirit is translated out of Ruach. And then we see this additionally in 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, when Micaiah is prophesying against Ahab. And we look specifically at verse 23, where it says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. And so multiple times the word spirit comes out of Ruach. But the second way that spirit is used when translated from Ruach is that it seems to refer to the inward parts of man. So you have it kind of as a standalone entity for man, and then you have it associated with man, and this is the second sense. And so in Genesis 41.8, after Pharaoh has the troubling dream that would be interpreted later of a prophecy, or as a prophecy of famine, we're told in the morning his spirit, speaking of Pharaoh, so in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there, were no, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So we're told the spirit of Pharaoh was troubled. 
indicating the spirit is affiliated with emotion or has some kind of emotional attachment. Another example is 1 Samuel 1.15, and this is kind of a, a really great passage for understanding the differences between, or similarities between Ruach and Nefesh, uh, because we used the same verse last time talking about Nefesh, um, but this passage also uses Ruach. So again, 1 Samuel 1.15, and this is concerning Hannah when she was weeping bitterly over her barrenness. And so it says, but Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. So you have spirit and soul used here. And she was troubled in spirit, and she was pouring out her soul. So here spirit is associated with emotion, since it was troubled. But soul is associated with emotion, since it is the soul she is pouring her emotions out of. And in this passage, soul and spirit have a parallel use. We see another use in Proverbs 13, 15, when the writer says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but my sorrow of heart, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. The spirit is associated with sorrow of heart. And so spirit is being used to denote the inward part of man and is often tied to emotion, much like soul is. And again, remember the the classic view of the trichotomous position is that spirit refers to the immaterial portion of man that interacts with the divine. So again, the um, soul is uh, associated with the human experience while the spirit is associated with divine experience. So the soul is kind of the horizontal plane of the immaterial man and the spirit is the vertical plane of the immaterial man according to the trichotomous position. Um, But again, that's why I have a hard time believing that distinction, essentially because we see the spirit used so often to refer to human experience as well. But in the New Testament, we see a little more variation with the word spirit. As you may have guessed, the word translated as spirit is pneuma. And while it is used to refer to wind and breath and spirit, Um, When it's used to refer to spirit, it's used in three different ways. So kind of like the Old Testament. So it's used to refer to actual spirits like demons um, or unclean spirits. It's also used to refer to the Holy Spirit. That's where we get uh, pneumatology from, study of the Holy Spirit. And then used to refer to our inner spirit, so the inner man. Just some uh, quick examples. Um, In Acts chapter 17, verse 16... When Paul was at Athens, we are told, Now Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And then in first Acts 17, 16. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we're told, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of of God. So spirits used almost the same way between the Old and New Testaments with the exception of it being predominantly used to refer to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So that's that's kind of it for the big three of the human constitution about body, soul, and spirit. And so from here we'll move on to talking about the heart, the mind, and the conscience. And before we get into these and we'll kind of do a little bit of heart today and then we'll finish mind and conscience next time but before we cover these I want to make a distinction between these parts of the person and the parts that we've just covered so the body the soul and the spirit because I'm sure you've noticed but when we're talking about the positions of monism and dichotomism and trichotomism um, heart mind and conscience are not there they're not referenced they're not generally considered part of the division of elements of the human constitution And that's because they're not considered to be major components of the Constitution, but are instead terms that the scriptures use to reference functions of the human experience or functions of those constituent elements. So what that means is when discussing these terms, theologians view them not as specific divisions of man, but rather as the foundation of certain function of those divisions of man or of those components of man. 
So for example, the heart is the seat of the emotive and moral functions of the soul. So the heart is not this standalone division, but with how scriptures use it, the heart is term is the term that it gives for the function of the soul. Because as we learned last time together, we learned that the soul has many functions, that the scripture affiliates the soul with numerous functions. And so when we're, and so we know that the soul can be categorized into having emotional qualities, it can have moral qualities, it can have nature, it can have mentality, it can have the ability to reason between right and wrong, according to the scriptures. And so theologically speaking, when it comes to how the words are used in the scriptures, the heart, the mind, and the conscience are functions of the soul, with the heart possessing the emotional and moral components the mind containing these, those intellectual or reasoning components, and the conscience containing that, the ability to reason between right and wrong, between what is morally correct and what is morally incorrect. And also, as you can guess, these components are all connected as well, um, because they're all part of the soul, or they're all functions of the soul. So as goes the heart, so goes the mind. As goes the mind, so goes the conscience. As goes the conscience, so goes the heart, and so on. They're all interconnected. And since all these functions of the same components of man is the soul, if the soul is redeemed, then so also is the heart, so also is the mind, so also is the conscience, and vice versa once again. And so that's why the whole man can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, because the mind is connected to all the other elements. The mind cannot be truly separated from the conscience nor the heart. And so by our mind being renewed, so also is the conscience and the heart renewed. They're all functions of the same constituent element of the human person, which is the soul. And so we'll, we'll go through heart very, very briefly. I know we don't have that much longer this morning. And so with a few, with a few minutes we have left, we'll talk about the heart. But... The heart in scripture is associated with emotion, but it is also affiliated with holy or sinful motives. So the word translated as heart occurs about 600 times in the Old Testament as leb. And Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 6 actually shows us both functions the Bible ascribes to heart. So Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 6. And in here we're told, the Lord saw the, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the, on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So in verse 5, we're told that the intentions and thoughts of the heart was evil. So the heart is associated with intention. The, the heart is associated with motive. It's, it's associated with thought here. And then in verse 6, though, we're told that God was grieved in his heart. So the, the heart is affiliated with intention and emotion in this passage. And as we know, we also know that in Exodus, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, which in turn influenced the actions that Pharaoh performed. So by hardening Pharaoh's heart, in essence, what was occurring is that his motives, his intentions, his thoughts, his emotions were hardened. His intentions turned against God, and his intentions were only to please his own self. Now, in the, in the New Testament, the Greek word translated as heart is cardia, and we see the same meaning as in the Old Testament. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So in other words, blessed are those who are pure in thought, pure in motive, pure in their intention. We also see that evil or good deeds come from the heart as well, just like as we see in the Old Testament's use of Leb. In Luke 6.45, we are told that the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. And that's also why we must love God with all our heart. For it is out of the heart that we think, that we feel, that, and ultimately that we act. And that's also why in Philippians 4, 7, we're told 
and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Because the heart's function is crucial. And so it is equally crucial that the heart is guarded. And not only that, but the heart is something that is guarded by Christ. And then, of course, we also see examples of the heart being affiliated with emotion in the New Testament. Um, in John 16, 22, when Jesus is speaking of his second coming, he tells the apostles, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. And then when Paul was at Caesarea, the Christians heard the prophet Agabus. They heard what would happen to Paul if he went to Jerusalem. And so they begged Paul not to go. But in Acts 21, 13, Paul responds to them and says, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So again, heart is affiliated with emotion. So between the Testaments, we see the same use for both of them, that heart has the functions of emotion and of morality. And so that's why the heart is that function of the soul. It is referred to in scripture as the emotional and the moral component, or the emotional and functional, or the emotional and moral component of the soul, or the function. And so, again, while soul is associated more often with these attributes than the heart is, the heart is also associated with them. And so logically it makes sense that the soul is the broader element of the human constitution in which these functions occur. But the heart specifically is what scripture seems to assign these functions to. Therefore, this is why theologians view the heart as the emotional and moral function of the soul. Um, but with that, that'll, we'll, we'll end it there for this morning. But that'll wrap up our discussion on the heart and then um, the next Sunday we're together, we'll talk about the mind and the conscience. But I'll close this in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we, how we love your word and, and how we dive into even things that, that may seem so esoteric or maybe things that don't seem as, as significant or as important as other, as other doctrines. But even as we dive in and look at these, we are still amazed at the depth and the breadth of of your word and how how much is there and how much there is to learn about ourselves in light of you and in light of your perfections and in light of your attributes and and how we can glean so much even from these seemingly small doctrines and seemingly small things that we can learn and so father we thank you for the depth of the scriptures and we thank you for the the fact that you have revealed these things to us and father where where your scriptures do not go, we ask that you stop us from going. We ask that you help us to be satisfied only with what you have placed in your word and you, and you help us not go outside the bounds of scripture and outside the, the text. And Father, sometimes when, when talking about these topics, when talking about these ideas, that can, they can get a little esoteric, they can get a little deep, and sometimes it's tempting to formulate theories and think of things that your scriptures don't actually say and don't lead us to go. And so, Father, as we continue to go through these studies, we ask that you help us be bound and confined to your scripture and to your word alone. That way we don't go outside those boundaries of what you have seen fit to reveal to us. And so, Father, we, we thank you for your word and your guidance, and we thank you for your help as we go through these topics. But, Father, we also ask that you bless the that you bless the sermon this morning. We ask that you bless the rest of our time together. May you humble our hearts and may you give us clarity of thought. May you speak to us to the power of your Holy Spirit through our pastor this morning. We ask that our worship be pleasing to you and that our worship be done in obedience with how, what you have commanded and how you have commanded us to worship you and how you've commanded yourself to be worshiped by us. And we ask that you stir our affections for you and you fill our ourselves with joy as we remember, yes, we are sinners, but we remember that you have sent your son to die for us and that we have redemption through your son. And so may we be filled with joy this morning as we remember those realities, but may we also be filled for the task of responsibility as we know that we are have been tasked with proclaiming your gospel to the ends of this earth.
And may it start in our homes and may it start in our city. And we ask these things in the name of your son. Amen.